Chapter 18 of The Boy Scouts on Sturgeon Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boy Scouts on Sturgeon Island by Herbert Carter. What Thad Found Out. That sounds good to me, Thad, remarked Alan. Hold on before you say that, the other went on to say, significantly. What about it? demanded Alan. Because we don't know who they may be, if there are men out here, answered the cautious scoutmaster. The other gave a low whistle that stood for surprise. I see now what you mean, he observed. But what makes you think there are others here, when they never lifted a hand to help us, and haven't as much as dropped in to sit at our fire? "'Well, perhaps they don't want to see us,' Thad told him. "'Oh, yes, we were talking about smugglers, "'and then we ran across that Mr. Stebbins who knew all about us, "'and he was one of a party looking up the slick men "'who fetch things over from Canada to escape the heavy duties. "'But, Thad, do you really believe there could be a bunch of that stripe "'hiding out on Sturgeon Island?' "'I don't know anything yet, Alan.' except that I've reason to know we're not alone out here, that's all. Well, what did you see, or hear? asked the other. This is what happened, Thad went on to say, in a low tone, though the storm was still making such a racket that he had to put his mouth close to Alan's ear in order to allow him to catch what he said. While the rest kept up their talking, I came out here to see how things looked, and make up my mind whether we were going to have any wet with this gale or not. Yes, and it don't look like it now, Thad, because it's gone so far. Reckon it must be what they call a dry storm, but go on and tell me the rest. Well, I was standing about here, in the dense shadow, you see, thinking, when all at once I discovered that there was something moving between me and the fire. Phew, muttered Alan, deeply impressed. Of course, at first I thought it might be only a fox, or something like that, curious enough to want to creep up and learn what sort of intruders had landed on Sturgeon Island. I could see that the bushes were moving softly, and that soon the thing, whatever it was, would come in sight of where stood here. And did it? Alan demanded. That's right, replied the other, softly, and it turned out to be a man's head. At that, the other scout again gave one of his low whistles to show that he was listening, and dully impressed by the startling information conveyed. Of course, continued Thad, I couldn't make out what he was like, very well, because his face was turned away from me, but as near as I can say, he was a big man, a rough-looking chap, and ugly in the bargain. More than that, he struck me like he might be a half-breed, or else Italian, for his skin was very dark. Well, what did he do? inquired the other. Just lay there watching the rest of you for several minutes, Alan. I could see him elevate his head at times, and then duck like a flash when he thought someone might be looking his way, which showed pretty plainly that he didn't want to be seen, and that he didn't mean to step forward and join the crowd. Then he went away, did he? continued the other. Yes, backed off, and I lost track of him among the rocks and the bushes, Thad went on to say impressively. It struck me as a queer proceeding and I didn't lose much time in getting you out here, so I could talk it over. Perhaps there's only one, all told, and he might be some fellow who's escaped from prison and is in hiding away off here, where he thinks no one will ever take the trouble to look for him, Alan suggested. The scoutmaster shook his head. I can't say just what he is, or whether there's a dozen here, he observed, but I do know that all his actions were suspicious, for no honest fisherman would do what he did. We'll have to be on our guard, then, Thad. That goes without saying, until we know more about who our neighbors are, the scoutmaster replied. It sort of complicates the situation some, too, don't it? Alan asked. Yes, and perhaps we'd better not say anything to the rest until we learn something more about this thing, Thad told him. How are you going to do that, when this man seems disposed to give us the cold shoulder, inquired the other. I had about made up my mind to go off for a little stroll and see what I could run across nearby, 
the scoutmaster continued. This island isn't so very large, but I could find my way around. And while that storm is howling, I'm not anxious to cross over to the other side. This is the sheltered part, and like as not these people, whoever they turn out to be, will have taken up their camp somewhere about here. But I wanted to warn you so you might make sure none of the other fellows wandered off. I'll see to it, though I don't think they're apt to do anything of that sort, as they're a tired bunch right now, Alan assured him. And while you're about it, continued the other, impressively, you'd better keep your hand on that shotgun of ours all the while, until you see me beckon to you again. That sounds like you expected we'd be up against it good and hard before this game came to an end, remarked Alan. Oh, not necessarily, replied his chum. It's only following our motto, be prepared. You know there are a whole lot of sayings along that line, such as, forewarned is forearmed, and as the old pilgrim fathers used to say, trust in the Lord, but keep your powder dry. We want to keep our ammunition ready, but while you go back to the rest of the boys, I'll take a sneak. Don't you think you'd better take that gun along with you, Thad? Not at all, was the quick reply. I'll depend on the darkness and the noise of the storm to keep from being seen or heard, but I'm bent on trying to find out whether there's any sort of shack or cabin built here on Sturgeon Island. Well, take good care of yourself, warned Alan, a little uneasily, for it was almost on his lips to ask why he might not be permitted to keep the scoutmaster company, for he did hate so much to see Thad pull out alone. He insisted on gravely shaking hands before he would leave his partner to return to the camp under the rocky shelf. They had been so much together of recent years that these two boys were exceedingly fond of each other, more so than brothers could ever have been, which was one reason why Alan disliked seeing the other moving away into the darkness and taking voluntarily upon himself the dangers such a scout involved. Obeying orders, he himself made his way back to where the other sat. Giraffe was holding out and explaining something that he had advanced but evidently he must have noticed the absence of the others, for he soon asked, "'What's the good word, Alan? Because I reckon you and our scoutmaster have been taking a squint at the weather. I was just telling the rest here that we won't get any wet with this blow, because all the signs point that way, as I said before. I'm getting to be an authority on weather nowadays.' "'That was about what we thought,' Alan told him. "'You mean that Thad is with me in my assertion, do you?' demanded Giraffe, and when the other had nodded in the affirmative, the tall scout turned to Davy, Bumpus, and Step Hen triumphantly to add, There, didn't I tell you I could hit these weather changes on the handle every time? When I warn you next time there's going to be a storm, better hurry to get in out of the wet. I think it's a great pity you waste your precious time bothering about what the weather is a-going to be, when we can't help it and you might be racking that really stupendous brain of yours a doing other things worthwhile, Bumpus went on to remark. Huh, as what? Giraffe wanted to know. Well, famines in the eating line, for one thing, spoke up the fat scout instantly. Suppose now you told us we was going to run up against hard times, in the way of a scarcity of grub two days back. Couldn't we just as well have dropped into some town along the shore and stacked up with heaps and heaps of good things? Seems to me, Giraffe, you've gone and wasted your talent on the wrong thing. What good is it ever a-going to do you to pretend to tell what sort of weather we'll get next week, when it's only a guess after all? Better make a change and predict famines and such things so we can take the alarm and buy out some country grocery. Giraffe had not one word to say in reply. He must have recognized the force of Bumpus's philosophy and wished in his heart he had been gifted with the spirit of prophecy, so that he might have given warning in due time as to the need of replenishing their stock of provisions. The conversation ran on, other subjects being taken up. Giraffe wanted to know what kept Thad away so long, and was told that the scoutmaster had concluded to take a little look around. At that, the other suggested that perhaps he too might stretch his legs, whereupon Alan informed him that he was under orders to keep them all close to the ledge under which they had found shelter, and that Thad had told him no one must be allowed to stray away a single yard. After that, the boys did not talk quite so volubly. Possibly some suspicion may have entered their minds that perhaps things were not quite so peaceful as they appeared on the surface, 
and that Thad might know of some reason for expecting a new batch of troubles to descend upon them. Alan kept sitting there, gun in hand. He was waiting to receive some sort of sign from Thad to tell him his presence was desired once again out there beside the tree where they had previously conferred. It seemed a very long time before he caught a movement there, and then saw the hand of the scoutmaster beckoning to him. Stay here, as Thad wants to talk with me, he told the rest, after which he strode forth to join the other. Well, did you find out anything? he asked, the first thing. Only this, replied Thad, solemnly. The island is occupied by a party of several rough men, who have a boat in a sheltered cove over there and a cabin half hidden among the rocks and brushwood. But the mystery of it all is what they may be doing here and why they look on us as enemies. End of chapter 18